good morning to everyone i welcome all of you to the 85th lecture in the lecture series in nonlinear dynamics conducted by the department of nonlinear dynamics bharati dawson university with the support from rusa 2.0 it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker professor leon glass from mcgill university montreal canada professor glass is not a new person to us he visited our department in the year 1998 exactly 25 years ago and spent time with us uh, in view of students i want to read out his bio data in a very brief manner professor leon glass obtained his phd in chemistry from university of chicago illinois usa in the year 1968 he started his teaching career in the university of rochester new york usa and moved to mcgill university as an assistant professor in the year 1975 he has a long teaching and research career since i don't want to occupy his time i will point out only few achievements of him he became the act or full professor in department of physiology of mcgill university in the year 1984 and he became the acting director of center for nonlinear dynamics in physiology and medicine in mckell university in the year 1993 he is currently holding the isodo rosen chair in cardiology and professor of physiology emeritus in mckell university professor class is studying various aspects of the applications of mathematical and physical methods to biology with a special interest in visual cardiac arithmetic and genetic networks Professor Glass had illustrated illustrative career receiving several awards in the year 1994 he received John Simon Cookim Memorial Foundation fellowship he has been the fellow of Royal Society of Canada since 1998 and also the fellow of American Physical Society since 1999 he won Jacques Rousseau prize for interdisciplinary research from ACFAS in the year 2003 and he is also a fellow in siam glass professor glass early work epinonomous patterns known as glass patterns provided insight into mathematical nature of human perception because of their mathematical simplicity and physiological underpinnings glass patterns have subsequently been used in dozens of algebra physiology and visual physiophysics experiments resulting in additional understanding of the physiology of visual perception He, his works on certain physiological disorders that that could be considered as dynamical diseases by characterizing sudden changes in the qualitative dynamics of a physiological control mechanism these features are illustrated in the mecke glass equations his works are all interesting since i i don't want to occupy his time and students i insist you to google his name and know more about his works So with this short introduction, now I invite Professor Glass to deliver his lecture. Over to you, Professor. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much for this invitation. Uh, in fact, it has been 25 years since I actually visited the campus, and I wish I could be there now with you. But. we'll do the second best which is use the amazing resources provided by the world wide web so i'm going to talk today about transitions and bifurcations and the the the, the basic topic is of relevant relevance in all areas of nonlinear dynamics and applications of nonlinear dynamics but the particular applications that i'm going to focus on are really specific in physiology although the same methods can be used in uh many other disciplines and have been suggested for use in many other disciplines uh when i talk about a sudden transition this is an example of what i mean this is an electrocardiogram of a lady whose heart rhythm was being monitored at the time of her death at the end here is a rhythm which is known as ventricular fibrillation and this is a disorganized uh irregular rhythm 
that doesn't pump blood through the body. And this particular woman died at this point in time. Earlier, a few hours earlier, there was what would be considered a normal heartbeat, a normal rhythm, with the interruption of occasional extra beats coming from the lower chambers of the heart, the ventricles. Uh, a little later, there was a rather complex pattern of a normal beat, abnormal beat, normal beat, abnormal beat, and then short bursts of abnormal beats that are called non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. So a question is, could this fatal transition have been predicted from an earlier point in time? It looks like what's happening at four in the afternoon is quite similar to what's happening later on. And there's a question, could we have predicted that? Another example from physiology is this example of epilepsy in which uh, activity from the scalp of someone is being monitored. And suddenly there's this striking transition to these big oscillatory waves that are associated with kind of a loss of uh, consciousness of the surroundings. And that goes on for a while and then just spontaneously terminates. This, this is just a record that I took from the data, from, from the literature. Now, uh, for people who are working in nonlinear dynamics in the current context, you might say, well, okay, here's a, I know how to attack that. Uh, we could collect a lot of data. We could do machine learning to try to see if there are any early warning signals which would be able to predict these imminent events happening, and then we could uh, patent the algorithm, we could make a device, we could sell it, and we could potentially make a lot of money because it would be quite useful if we could predict these events before they actually happen. People would be able to undertake certain, uh, you know, certain uh, changes of what they're doing. For example, if you had a seizure, while you were driving a car, that could, that could be very serious. If you knew five minutes beforehand that it was about to happen, you would have the opportunity to pull over to the side of the road. So uh, I went looking before preparing the talk for examples of using this strategy to collect a large amount of data, to use artificial intelligence to develop early warning signals, to start a company and to sell a device. And I found this quote from MedTech News in 2020. And they said the following, Epines, which is a, a device uh, developed by someone by the name of Orin Shriki, is a seizure prediction and detection device that is based on a combination of electroencephalograph based monitoring of brain activity together with machine learning algorithms. The device combines a wearable EEG device with software that minimizes the number of necessary EEG electrodes and optimizes electrode placement on the scalp. The sophisticated machine learning algorithms are designed to filter noise that is not related to brain activity, extract informative measures of the underlying brain dynamics, and distinguish between brain activity before an expected epileptic seizure and brain activity when a seizure is not expected to occur. So somebody was making a claim that they had developed a device that could do early warnings for epileptic seizures. However, I was not able to find any more information about that device subsequently, whether it's been tested, uh, high-level scholarly publications and so forth. So I think that this device, although this news report seems to indicate clearly that it's functional, was, was not realized, uh, was not turned really into a functional device, at least so far, as far as I can tell. Perhaps it is, and I missed the citation. Why is it difficult to do this? Uh, one is it's actually very hard to collect large curated data sets 
from people. There are all kinds of problems involved with collecting the data, privacy, and so forth. Another problem is that diseases are actually heterogeneous. So uh, having a cardiac arrest, having an epileptic seizure may not just be due to one thing. In fact, it can be due to many different factors. And because of this heterogeneity, it might be very hard to uh, make the necessary predictions. And then something important to me is that if an artificial device could work, it wouldn't necessarily give any insight into the dynamics, in insight into why the transitions are happening. So from the context of this seminar series and my own work, what I'd like to focus on now is trying to place the, uh, the quest for understanding of these dynamic transitions into a nonlinear dynamics framework. I'm going to start with three papers from 1977 before many of the students who might be listening, who I hope are listening, uh, were born. I'm then going to skip to a very influential paper by Martin Sheffer and colleagues printed in Nature in 2009. Then I will talk about some more recent work, some of which comes from our group, in 2015, and then much more recent work spearheaded by Thomas Bury and colleagues from 2021. I'll then try to switch and talk a little bit about a very specific problem in which I'm interested, dealing with risk stratification and early warning signals for sudden cardiac death, and talk specifically about the role of these extra complexes that I just showed you, these extra complexes coming from the ventricles, abnormal complexes that are called premature ventricular complexes. And then I'll just finish off by briefly mentioning worldwide efforts combining data analysis, modeling, simulation, and machine learning to predict disease onset. Now, this is the first paper which was briefly alluded to in the introduction. Um, so back in 1977, my colleague Michael Mackey and myself wrote an article in which we proposed a mathematical model for the rate of change of the production of blood cells. And the basic idea of the model was just to say that the rate of change of the number of blood cells is equal to the production minus the destruction. So we said the destruction is just... Uh, at a rate proportional to the number of cells that were present, but the production had interesting features. If you had lots of red blood, if you had lots of blood cells, you wouldn't need to make new cells, so the production rate would be low. If you had very few blood cells, then you'd be quite sick, and you wouldn't be able to produce many blood cells, so the maximal production rate of the blood cells would actually be for some intermediate levels of blood cells. However, the feedback loops of the body that give the signal to produce the blood cells have intrinsic time delays. So the rate of production at the current time is a function of the number of blood cells sometime preceding. When one writes down the actual equations and then, uh, searches in parameter space, you can find what's hap what you find in the bottom trace. The top trace is clinical data. The bottom trace is, ex is the theoretical data. You can generate a model that has irregular dynamics. These are chaotic dynamics, and this exists over certain ranges of parameters in the uh, equation. And the underlying equation is what was referred, what's now referred to by many as the Mackey-Glass equation. Now, concluding that paper, we said the following. We believe there is a large class of dynamical diseases, two of which have been considered here, characterized by the operation of a basically normal control system in a region of physiological parameters that produces pathological behavior. 
Our analysis suggests the following approaches. Demonstrate the onset of abnormal dynamics in animal models by gradually tuning of control parameters. Gather sufficiently detailed experimental and clinical data to determine whether sequences of bifurcation, similar to those found here, actually occur in physiological systems, and then attempt to devise novel therapies for disease by manipulating control parameters back into the normal range. So, in fact, these three statements have very much formed uh, my research, the basis for the research program that I've been working on back over the last uh, time, since 1977. There's one thing we left out and didn't mention in this, and that is, can our knowledge of nonlinear dynamics and gathering of data also be used to predict onsets of abnormal dynamics? So that thing that was left out in this early paper is the topic of the current talk. Now, this is an early review paper from Robert May, Thresholds and Breakpoints in Ecosystems with a Multiplicity of Stable States. He starts it off in a very poetic way. I'm not sure if people here know that Robert May, at the time he wrote this, was a professor of ecology at, in Princeton. He had been trained in Australia as a theoretical physicist, and he continued his career by moving to the United Kingdom, ending up to be the advisor, the science advisor to the, uh, to the government, to the queen. So he had a very, very distinguished career uh, and was a, a Sir Robert, Lord May, and then was Baron May. He says, in all but the most trivial areas of inquiry, there arise questions about the extent to which events are shaped by predictable natural laws as against the accidents of initial conditions and perturbations. And it goes on in a very poetic fashion for the first paragraph. What's he talking about? He illustrates what's happened, the basic idea of this review with a uh, theoretical model, a theoretical model that was not proposed by him but I believe was proposed by Don Ludwig in Vancouver. And the basic idea of the theoretical model is that you have vegetation and then you have a, a herbivore, a cow in a field. So the vegetation is grass growing in the field and H is the number of cows you have. So if you have very few cows, you're gonna have a lot of grass. The cows are gonna be very happy. Uh, they're going to be very well fed. The farmer, might decide, well, let's increase the number of cows going down and uh, having more cows in the same field. Well, there'll be less vegetation in the field, but the cows will still be pretty happy and pretty well fed. As you continue to increase the number of cows, you might reach, reach a critical point where suddenly the ecosystem collapses the cows, there are too many cows grazing in the field. Uh, their grass doesn't get a chance to grow and flourish. So the resources are very poor and you have a destruction of the ecosystem. And people talk about things like this happening in overuse of natural resources, particularly in things like fisheries. So May is talking about uh, falling off the cliff here and going to a situation in which there are very, very low vegetation, uh, there's a, essentially an ecological disaster. The basic ideas here were put forward in some sense by, by an area that was called catastrophe theory uh, developed by Rene Thom. Uh, this is from a, a review article that was published also in Nature just a few weeks after that May article, in the end of October 1977, May's article was the beginning of October in 1977. And what these two people, Zoller and Sussman, are doing are essentially talking about the same picture we had before, where we can have this 
uh, surface, which is now called a cusp catastrophe. Here we have a third parameter, which can change the geometry, even so that the possibility of two stable states that are present in the preceding example could collapse just to one steady state down there. So this is a cusp geometry that was discussed a lot by May as an underlying geometry that may be present in biological and other systems. Zoller and Sussman claims and accomplishments of applied catastrophe theory say several attempts to apply catastrophe theory to biological and social and social science problems turn out on close analysis to be characterized by incorrect reasoning, far-fetched assumptions, erroneous consequences, and exaggerated claims. Catastrophe theory seems to have made no significant contributions to biology and the social sciences and to have no advantage over other better established mathematical tools which have been used to better effect. So essentially uh, being very negative about the ideas concerning these transitions. Okay, I'm going to shift ahead now from 1977 to 2009. And in 2009, well, okay, before I do that, uh, before I do that, let me try to give you the ideas which had been germinating between 1977 and 2009, which really formed the basis for this 2009 paper. So uh, in 1981, a Chinese theoretical physicist, Hao Bai Lin, had a paper called Universal Slowing Down Exponent Near Period Doubling Bifurcation Points. Another theoretical physicist, Kurt Wiesenfeld, talked about noisy precursors of nonlinear instabilities. And similar ideas were in a paper by Tochner and Hanji in 1989. What is it that these people are talking about? The people were talking about the dynamics in a stochastic difference equation. X of n plus one is equal to AXN plus a noise term. If the noise term wasn't there, this would just be the simplest linear difference equation, the equation that underlies either exponential growth or exponential decay. It's a problem people do in high school where people talk about a geometric series. Each term in the geometric series is just uh, proportional to the preceding term in the series. This is what it says. If A is between plus one and minus one, the capital A here is between plus one and minus one, then as you keep on iterating, X of N goes to zero. If capital A is bigger than plus one or less than minus one, then the series is going to diverge off to infinity or oscillating between plus and minus infinity. So, if you add the noise term, then it's no longer deterministic, but what you could do is you can compute the autocorrelation function of the successive terms, and you could also plot the standard deviation of the probability distribution of, of the value of x as you have different values of this uh, coefficient of the linear term a. And what happens as you get closer to plus one or minus one, the autocorrelation uh, decays more slowly, or this width of the distribution of the probability density becomes wider. So this is just hap this is just what you see from that stochastic difference equation when a here is minus 0.05, when A is minus 0.65, and when A is minus 0.95. And all of those represent a stable steady, that there's a stable steady state uh, if there was no stochastic terms, but the fluctuations have characteristic shapes uh, 
which change as you get closer to the point where capital A is either equal to plus one or minus one, which is where the steady state would become unstable and you would go off to another behavior. So this particular figure I showed was done more recently in a paper by uh, Thomas Quell, one of our students, uh, former students at McGill, who's now in Germany. Uh, and I'll say more about that paper in a second, but it's just to illustrate the basic concepts of what happens as you go near to a bifurcation point, a phenomenon that people have termed critical slowing down. So here's the here's a figure. So I'll just say a little bit about this particular article. So here's this figure from, from this 2009 paper uh, by Martin Sheffer and colleagues. And essentially what they're doing is reintroducing the basic idea of this cusp catastrophe showing how as you can get close to the edge and you can undergo a transition as a parameter is particularly changing here, the conditions change so you can go and fall off the edge. And what they were emphasizing is that the autocorrelation and the variance are going to show the characteristic signs as I just described as you get closer and closer to that transition point. To take one other figure from that article, this is a description or this is uh, an, an, a reproduction of an earlier, an earlier paper from Nature Medicine in which somebody was saying that before the onset of an epileptic seizure, there would be an increase of the variance, just as I was describing, and that this could provide a measure of a warning sign that this epileptic seizure was imminent. So they were relying for that analysis on this earlier paper from 2003, but in between the 2003 paper and the 2009 paper that Sheffer had, there was a review article by people who were trained in neurology that said, the more rigorous methodological design in many recent seizure prediction studies has shown that many of the measures previously considered suitable for prediction perform no better than a random predictor. In other words, that this earlier paper was looking at a particular case, but if one actually did controlled and more, you know, more detailed and controlled studies looking for false positives, false negatives, and so forth, that in fact, this didn't really work. Now, there are, are a lot of reasons why the ideas that were put through, put forth by Sheffer and colleagues would not work. One of them is that the rate of change of control parameters is critically important in how much of a warning you might get as you go through a particular transition, assuming that that model was even, you know, assuming the model is correct, it's very important to get control of the time constants. Another factor is the issue is the transition, really a transition from a steady state. They were saying there's a steady, a transition from a steady state rather than other dynamics. For example, from uh, periodic oscillation or chaotic dynamics or something, even much more noisy than, than, a, than a low dimensional chaos. Another issue is what's the quality of the data. Many of the examples that were given in the Sheffer article dealt with ecology, uh, climate, predicting an ice age and so forth, where the quality of the data uh, was very, it's very hard to collect some of those data and there's a lot of noise in the data. So the reliability of the data is something that I am not convinced about. Some of these issues were raised by previous authors shortly after the appearance of that initial article, Diddleson and Janssen in 2010, and Alan Hastings and Wisham in, 20, in 2010. 
And then there have been other subse subsequent critiques of this. So I, I think, you know, my bottom line is that a lot of the analysis in that nature paper uh, is open to quite severe criticism. However, the basic idea that you might be able to come up with predictors of dynamical transitions is based on very, very sound principles in nonlinear dynamics. So it's an intriguing idea. Uh, it was really an extremely influential paper with which now has thousands of citations. Now, I'm gonna skip forward now to uh, work that came from our group, uh, initially Thomas Quayle, and then other work that I was not involved in by Thomas Brewery and colleagues. So a, in our laboratory, we have done many experiments with embryonic chick heart cell aggregates. So this is a preparation that my colleague, Alvin Schreier, uh, learned and worked on when he was a postdoctoral fellow in Emory University. And uh, we have carried out many experiments and theoretical studies related to these aggregates of cells. Uh, and for people, I hope that you're able to see this online. Oh, let's see if I can get the movie to play. Ah, okay, so you should be able to see those cells beating. They beat about once per minute, and, sorry, once per second, and that's just about a tenth of a millimeter in diameter. It's a tiny ball of cells. One of, one of the postdoctoral fellows who was visiting in Montreal, Min Young Kim from Korea, did an experiment in which she introduced a drug which blocks certain uh, components of the cell called potassium channels. The drug is E4031, if, any, if anyone is curious about that. After addition of the drug, there's complicated evolution of the dynamics. This is a plot of the interbeat intervals, the timing between two of those little contractions, two of those little heartbeats after addition of the drug. So, and this is continuous data going over essentially an hour. Initially, the heartbeat is rather constant, but as time goes on, there is a change of the dynamics where there's an alternation. You can't see it on this time scale, but there's actually a short beat and a long beat, and it just alternates together, short beat followed by a long beat. And as time goes on, the dynamics get to be somewhat more complicated. For people who are theoretical, mathematicians who are used to looking at what might be called a bifurcation diagram, for example, looking at the bifurcation diagram from the logistic map, people plot these kinds of diagrams uh, by changing a parameter. So what's really amazing in this particular experiment is that as the drug diffuses into this little ball of cells, there is a sequence of changes happening which changes the dynamics in this rather amazing, uh, you know, rather amazingly complicated and interesting way. What our student Thomas Quill said when he, I was talking to him about that, the paper from Sheffer, he said, well, we could do an analysis of the data that, that you collected on this, uh, transition to period doubling bifurcations following the drug, and we can see if you can come up with an early warning signal. So for people who are mathematicians and physicists here, he took the data and he fit the data to just a one-dimensional difference equation that would undergo bifurcations. Essentially, the bifurcations took place as you would 
shift this curve up and up and down. So he was hypothesizing that the effect of the drug is to essentially shift this curve up and down, and it would undergo a sequence of bifurcation similar to what was observed here. So um, but then he also plotted one beat, the duration of the time between one between two beats as a function of the duration of the time between the preceding two beats. So this is the plot of this uh, one beat as a function, the interbeat interval of one, at one time as a function of the interbeat interval at the preceding time. And when he did the plotting, he found very similar phenomena. This is, ex this is the experimental data. He found very similar data to the expected transitions that you see in this one-dimensional finite difference equation with noise. Based on that, and using the concepts of the autocorrelation function, change in autocorrelation function and increased variance, he was be able to come up with a predictor for the bifurcations that would occur for the experimental data that had been collected previously. Now, and he came up and, and, and what we think is it was a reasonably good predictor, but one thing to notice from this is that the amount of warning that would be given by the predictor in some cases could be several hundred beats, and in some cases could just be a few beats. So, you know, the, the, this, is, this is an experimental system. How good would that be in a practical system? Not clear, but it shows that the early warning is something which is possible, and it did work reasonably well in this very constrained data set collected in a laboratory. Now, uh, Thomas Bury was, was a graduate student in Waterloo, and he became interested in the issue of deep learning for early warning signals, uh, working in the, in the group of Christopher Bausch. So in order to do this, in order to try to develop uh, neural network models and do deep learning, he, you need a lot of data in order to train a, a classifier. The way he generated the data, I think, is a fantastic way. He generated random dynamical systems. This is just looked at two-dimensional random dynamical systems. Then he located and analyzed the bifurcations that would take place in these systems as he changed parameters. And he developed, he used that, the actual bifurcations that were occurring in these model systems to generate a classifier, to train a neural network, to identify the classifications, and to distinguish the fold bifurcation from a from a Hopf bifurcation, from a transcritical bifurcation. This is a schematic of the work that they did. This was from the PNAS article. He develops the criteria and he applies those and then it's applied to different published ecological models that showed fold bifurcation, hop bifurcation, transcritical bifurcation. The bottom line of all of this is he has from the deep learning algorithm, he comes up with the probability of a particular bifurcation taking place. And this appears to be better than what you can come up with using the preceding 
techniques that what people were using, using the autocorrelation or the variance. So this, I think, is an extremely imaginative way to go about trying to uh, improve our ability to do detection of early warning signals. Thomas very recently said, well, that, that work that he was doing was based on differential equations and bifurcations and differential equations. It did not include difference equations. So he went and he also ra randomly generated systems of difference equations where there were bifurcations. He did deep learning once again to train a classifier. And then he also re-examined the bifurcations present in, in the chick heart cell aggregates after being given a drug. And the claim that he has on the bottom line is that the classifier that he developed was actually better than the other classifiers that, that you could come up with simply based on the autocorrelation or the variance. So the notion is that the, the classifier is picking up something which goes beyond what appears to be happening simply based on that linear difference equation with noise. So I think it's extremely interesting. This work has not yet been submitted for publication. Uh, it hopefully will be submitted for publication uh, quite, quite soon. Okay. I want to talk about a particular topic, which is really of great, great interest to me, uh, and is also of obvious practical significance. So uh, people are familiar with the notion that sudden cardiac death is something that, that happens. There was this recent uh, example, I, I just, it was probably probably got some publicity in India. It was it was a great deal of news about this in the United States, where a football player involved in a play got a big thump to his chest, and essentially his heart went into this rhythm, ventricular fibrillation, which was not pumping blood. And very luckily, uh, people were able to resuscitate him, give his heart a shock. And so he was able to survive. We have not had any information about whether, whether uh, there were any abnormalities of his heart that may predispose him to that. But it is known that a sudden hit to the heart, to the chest, at a very specific time of the cardiac cycle can give rise to what's known as sudden cardiac death. But sudden cardiac death can also happen in other people with, without getting a sudden hit to their chest. And some people were known to have risk for sudden cardiac death and others not. So once again, here's showing this example once again, where this lady had this episode, uh, had these abnormal rhythms with this premature ventricular complex interspersed among the normal complexes, but comparatively rarely at 3.42 in the afternoon. At four, there were alternations of normal and abnormal complexes, the sinus beat, the normal sinus beat, the premature ventricular complex, the non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, happening in very interesting patterns for anybody who loves nonlinear dynamics. And then at 7.13, a rhythm very similar to the one at 4.05 with a longer episode of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, one normal beat, and then ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation leading to the patient's death. Now, it appears that these abnormal beats may be playing a role 
in inducing or precipitating these rapid and abnormal sequences of beats. Going back, oh, sorry, let me just say this. So the notion of risk stratification and early warning signals for sudden cardiac death is not a new idea that this might be something worth doing. Back in the 1990s, Richard Cohen, who's a professor at MIT, developed uh, a test called microvolt T-wave alternans. This was essentially looking at very subtle changes in the morphology and the shape of the complexes on the electrocardiogram. He was observing, and others had observed, that there's often an alternation, uh, a subtle alternation in the shape of these complexes before the onset of serious arrhythmias. He developed a company called Cambridge Heart. The company received NIH certification for the device. There were talks at major conferences about the utility of the device, but to date at least, these as a clinical test has not proven to be sufficiently useful so that it would be financially feasible to carry it out. So the company Cambridge Heart is essentially defunct and has been for uh, several years now. Another uh, scientist uh, named Skip Skinner at Baylor was talking about the correlation dimension, people who work in nonlinear dynamics, as many of the people here may be familiar with correlation dimension. The essential idea of this, even if you don't know about it, is that before the onset of a serious arrhythmia, there was a notion that the rhythm would be simplified. It would not be complicated. It would get to be somewhat simpler and that would be associated with the lower uh, correlation dimension. And he also started a company, which, uh, which I don't think lasted particularly long. And I don't think there was very good evidence that that was going to work. There was pretty good evidence in support of the alternans, but in point of the correlation dimension, uh, there was not particularly good evidence for that. Uh, however, neither of these have really panned out from a practical perspective, at least so far. I've been fascinated with these extra heartbeats, these premature ventricular complexes. I've been interested in them for a long time. Uh, this is from an early slide, not, not from our group. Uh, the early, this early slide said, well, if you go into a doctor's office, and you do a measurement of someone's electrocardiogram over a short period of time, uh, over, over an hour or so, that the number of these premature ventricular complexes that you may see in those, in those recordings was correlated with, the, with death rate of, the, of those people in the future. Now, probably everybody who's listening here has some of these premature ventricular complexes. So if you have them, you may know that you have them or you may not know that you have them, but uh, in the large majority of people, these premature ventricular complexes, even if they're quite frequent, are considered to be benign. However, there is some evidence that in some percentage of people, they may be associated with increased risk of death. So at an early stage, cardiologists said the following. They said, well, if these extra heartbeats, these premature ventricular complexes are associated with an increased risk for death, then we can actually have a treatment. 
There are some drugs that decrease the number of premature ventricular complexes. So they said, well, let's give these drugs to people who have these complexes, and then let's see if it works. Let's see if there are fewer people who die. So what they did was they took uh, about 1,500 people who had had a heart attack. They'd had a blockage of their coronary artery. They also had lots of these premature ventricular complexes. They gave the drug to 750 people. They, gave, they withheld the drug. They gave a placebo to another 750 people. And they counted the number of people who died as a function of time. And what they found out, much to their surprise, was that the people who took the drug had a higher rate of death than the people who took the placebo. So they disproved the hypothesis that they could uh, reduce sudden cardiac death or seri serious arrhythmias by giving this drug. This is called the Cardiac Arrhythmia Suppression Trial. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in the year 1989. Now, despite, despite this, I, I think that it's probably fair to say that cardiologists now, and I don't know if any cardiologists may be, may be listening, and if, or any medical doctors who who are family doctors who are used to seeing patients that might have premature ventricular complexes. Uh, I think that largely in medicine now, there's not great attention paid to these complexes, but from a point of view of nonlinear dynamics, I'm fascinated by these complexes, and I would like to understand much better the underlying mechanisms of those and also develop ways to predict in which patients those complexes may be associated with serious arrhythmias. So this is a record from a 16-year-old boy who had a heart defect that was surgically corrected at a young age, who fainted on the lunch line in a school cafeteria. And the question, uh, is does this have, does this record, does he have a, a high risk for sudden cardiac death? And there's also a question about what's the mechanism of what's happening here. So this is a record that was given, was located, was found by a cardiologist working in the hospital where this, where this young fellow uh, came in. It, his name is David Gordon. Uh, he had actually been trained as a theoretical physicist and, in fact, uh, worked at one time and knew uh, the very famous Mitch Feigenbaum. So he knew I was interested in these records, and he uh, and I collaborated along with Daniel Scalgliati and Mark Kortmanch on analysis of, of the record that was present here. So I've been talking here to give the mathematicians a chance to think about what was happening here. This is one of these abnormal beats. I'm sorry that the labeling is different. This is what we call the V beat, premature ventricular complex. This is a normal beat, the sinus beat. Uh, one of the things we can do here is we can count the number of normal beats between abnormal beats. And we see here is there are four normal beats between the two abnormal beats. Here there are two and there there's one. So we ask the question, uh, what's the mechanism of this? And can we have a theory for those three numbers, the four, two, and one? So if we were in the same room together, I would ask people and we could spend a lot of time discussing this, but I'll just move on. The mechanism of what's happening here I believe, is that there's a normal beat. This is the normal beat that's beating with a rather regular rhythm in this short interval. That's over here. There's an abnormal pacemaker, 
also beating with the red regular interval. Here, after the normal beat, there's a refractory period during which an abnormal beat could not be present. But if the abnormal beat comes outside of that refractory period, you see it, but you do not see the next normal beat. So here, this abnormal beat is coming also during the refractory period, so you don't see anything. Here, the normal beat and the abnormal beat are coming at almost exactly the same time according to this mechanism. And what you see on the surface electrocardiogram is a different complex that doesn't look like the normal beat or the abnormal beat. A cardiologist calls that a fusion beat. And the interpretation is it's a beat that started in two different places and it has a different, ge has a different geometry. So you can actually go through this whole record and over longer periods than this. And there's actually quite close correspondence between this particular mechanism and what you actually see. So can you come up with the theory of what's happening there? And the answer is yes, you can. So we gave a very, very simple mechanism of two pacemakers with their own intrinsic rhythm. And Given that mechanism that I just described on the preceding transparency, you can count the number of normal beats between two of the abnormal beats. And given the period of the normal beat, given the period of the abnormal beat, given the refractory period, we know for any values of those, in the sequence of the number of normal beats between abnormal beats, there are gonna be three integers, one, two, and four. One of those integers is odd. For example, one is odd, two and four are even. And the sum of the two smaller integers is one less than the largest. So one plus two is equal to three, which is one less than four. And moreover, we're able to look and see as the parameters change, here, one of the parameters sets the scale of time. So in fact, there are only two parameters, the refractory time scaled by the timing, the period of the sinus beat, and the abnormal cycle time of the abnormal pacemaker scaled by the timing of the sinus beat. For any values of those, we can actually determine what the values of those three numbers are gonna be. And uh, this analysis was put forward in, in an article with Ari Goldberger, who's a cardiologist, and Jacques Belair, who's a mathematician at the University of Montreal. Skip forward to the present. Uh, in that analysis, we did not take into account the spatial location of the pacemakers. And uh, we have carried out a study to try to examine the effects of spatial location. One of the things that was done is developing what's called an optogenetic tissue culture. And this is work that was done by, uh, in the laboratory of Gil Bubb with very excellent experimental work carried out, experimental and theoretical work by a graduate student, Katie Diagne. So in this experiment, uh, the tissue culture is grown, it's about a centimeter in diameter. And by flashing a light at different frequencies, Bub is able to have waves which are going to uh, go across this excitable media and they can collide and annihilate. So he can independently control the frequencies from two different pacemakers at different points in this excitable media. So this article actually came out within the, the last month. When that's done, this is now based on data that was collected. The blue arrows represent the rap, more rapid stimulation from the position which is considered to be like the normal pacemaker. And the red was from the position which is like the abnormal pacemaker. 
And this is in one point in space and this is in another point in space. So uh, one can independently vary the pacemaker frequencies. One can look at different points in space and count the number of normal beats between, or blue beats between the two red beats. For example, here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. At that position in space, the position in space is horizontal. The time is, sorry, position in space is in the vertical. Here, if we looked at the numbers of blue beats between red beats, we get to come back to the sequence one, two, and four once again. So at different points in space, you see different values of for these three numbers. Once again, you have the three numbers. It's possible to look at what happens in the experiment to compare it with simple cellular automata model that's just based on exactly what I was describing. There can be close agreement. Moreover, you can use this as a way to see what happens in individual patients. This is now actually data that was collected by cardiologists on individual patients in which there are the different time intervals between the different types of beats is shown by different colors. Once again, there are characteristic patterns that agree with the theoretical model. So in extending the theoretical model in the recent work, we have to take into account uh, the factor of the spatial location in the tissue. So uh, I would refer people, I'm going through this rather quick. I'm gonna to try to finish up very quickly because my time is basically over. Uh, the uh, agreement between the experiment and the theory and even the hypothesized mechanism in individual patients and what you expect theoretically is actually quite good. So it's kind of an amazing application of what's happening in patients. Very few patients seem to have this particular mechanism and the extent to which this mechanism may be serious or not serious is something which is completely unknown at the moment. So we're very much in favor of trying to understand the mechanism of these extra beats in different patients. And this is the work we're working on right now. Okay, so I'm just gonna have three quick slides and then finish up or, or a few quick slides. There are worldwide efforts now underway combining modeling, simulation, machine learning to predict disease and onset. So here's a, from a paper that I was involved in published in Critical Care Medicine a few years ago in which we talk about the possibility of critical slowing down as being potential warning signs for uh, development of more serious disease. The, I, think, I think Klaus Lennertz was the speaker uh, in the series just a few days ago. And he has a review article from Nature in 2018 in which they're talking about epilepsy and they refer back to this review that I mentioned before. A highly influential review in 2007 concluded that insufficient evidence indicated the seizures could be predicted. Since then, several advances have been made including successful prospective seizure prediction using intracranial electroencephalogram in a small number of people in a trial of real-time seizure prediction device. So that these are people who are doing seizure prediction and they say that it's possible. And then finally, there's a group in Japan from Aihara, which is trying to apply this to other diseases such as uh, diabetes by analysis of fluctuations in uh, regulation of, of genes, okay? The Ihara Moonshot Project. So conclusions is predicting dynamic transitions is possible. I would say it's possible certainly in the context of the theoretical models, 
And it's probably also possible in at least some well-defined experimental situations. I believe that clinical applications will be developed. We definitely, I think we're on the, on the threshold of having combinations of big data and AI being used in order to try to detect these transitions, like I mentioned right at the beginning, and whether or not physiological insights, such as the physiological insight that I seek, uh, we don't know if that's needed. We don't know if mathematical insight or knowledge of nonlinear dynamics is going to be needed in order to get things that actually work. Maybe this can be done by people who don't know mathematics, don't do medicine, but know how to do neural networks. We'll see. To finish up, I just want to give this quote, very inspirational quote from Martin Schaeffer, who is really the pioneer in, in this area. We have all these complex systems like the brain, the climate, ecosystems, the financial market that are really difficult to understand, and we will probably never fully understand them. So it's really a kind of small miracle that across these very different systems, we could find these universal indicators of how close they are to a threshold. So uh, along the way, I have benefited greatly, greatly, greatly by my uh, association with a number of with a number of colleagues, and I've tried to mention them as I've gone along in the talk. And also, I've had uh, fortune for having my research supported. So I'd really be delighted to answer any questions. And I hope I get a chance to meet some of you in person at some stage. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, so this forum is now open for questions, clarifications, doubts. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, this is uh, Lakshman. And uh, 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 it has been a great pleasure to listen to you again after 25 years. Uh, <laughs> Sir Glass. Yeah, I have a, a general question. Uh, in recent times in this country, there has been a lot of news that several young people, young adults, uh, uh, some of them are very famous, after strenuous physical exercise, I mean, particularly during the COVID, I mean, pandemic and after the pandemic period, uh, after strenuous physical exercise, either in the gym or at their homes, uh, they had attacks, heart attacks, and died. Several people. So, do you see any any correlation between uh, between uh, the COVID or uh, or I mean, we didn't hear this kind of news earlier before the COVID period. So, do you have any comments on? Uh, uh, this large number of deaths that uh, that come out. Mm -hmm. so, so, so thank you for the question. So I'm I'm not a physician. Uh, I know I know that there's been some association of COVID with cardiac inflammation. Uh, I'm not aware of any descriptions or any any data that associate uh, increased risk of sudden death with COVID. You have to realize that there are certain heart conditions that are associated structural abnormalities of the heart that can be manifest in very young people. Uh, you know, there was a famous basketball player who died in the United States named Reggie Lewis, having collapsed during a, uh, either a game or, or a, I think during a, a game. You know, these are world-class athletes, but I believe that, I believe that in many of these cases, there are some structural abnormalities of their heart uh, called athlete's heart that are associated with a higher risk to death. So in India, 
the last I heard is that there may be 1.2 billion people or 1.3 billion people. Is that, I don't know what the number is, but that, that's a lot of people. So even if something is happening in one in 10,000 or one in 100,000 people, there may be a lot of people who are going to, uh, you know, the absolute numbers. And it's possible that there's more attention paid to some of these cases associated with, uh, you know, social media interest and so forth. So I don't, I don't know whether there's any evidence that there's increased incidence of these types of sudden cardiac death associated with COVID, but certainly sudden cardiac death in young, healthy people is something that can happen and it's well known to happen. And obviously these are tragic situations and anything that can be done to uh, increase our understanding of what happens would of course be greatly useful. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Swamadatta, you can raise your question, madam. Professor Swamadatta. Professor Singha, you can raise your question, madam. Hi, by the way. Hi, Sundara. How are you? Uh, Can't hear anything. I, I, is there a muting? Uh, no. Uh, just a minute, sir. Uh, so, Dr. Abjit, you can raise your question now. Thank you, Leon. This was a wonderful talk. <clears throat> My question is, when we are trying to make such predictions and equations and models, <clears throat> especially for disease like sudden cardiac death, what's the role of omics data? How can we incorporate that in our models? And how can we make better predictions using not just clinical data, but also omics, omics data? Yeah, so, so the use of omics data is something that IHARA in particular is very, very interested in at the, at the moment in our, in, in, the, in cardiac arrhythmias, there are some arrhythmias that are associated with abnormalities in ion channels and potassium channels. There are congenital situations that are associated with what's called long QT syndrome. Uh, and there are, there are a few other well-documented syndromes that are associated with genetic abnormalities. One is the Brugada syndrome. Yeah associated with uh, generally with mutated sodium channels. So the extent to which the, you know, the extent to which someone that has one of these abnormalities, you know, what percentage of the people with these abnormalities will go on to have uh, serious heart disease or arrhythmias is something I don't know. So th there would definitely be a possibility of doing an analysis. You know, it's possible. It's possible, and this is something that we feel very frustrated not getting good data on. To what extent do people who have lots of premature ventricular complexes also have some possibility of a genetic mutation? Some of, which, some of which may not be found. So these are areas in which there's definitely some work done in identifying genetic abnormalities associated with higher risk of death, but that hasn't been integrated in very carefully so far with the sort of detailed modeling and physiological understanding that I've been discussing. So just a small added. <clears throat> so do you prescribe them adding to the machine learning models just like that or or create more first principle based equations to solve yeah. that? What's so, the best approach? So so the thing the issue about the machine learning models for cardiac arrhythmias, you know, so 
what 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 are there are lots of there are lots of patients lots of people who have large numbers of premature ventricular complexes. We're working in the paper that was recently published. We're collaborating with cardiologists in Vancouver, Mark Dial and Zachary Laxman. Those are two cardiologists who have patients who have frequent premature ventricular complexes and they don't have a good understanding of which of those patients are going to go on to develop more serious disease or which of these patients will have complexes which will simply be here now but may just go away on a few weeks from now. So there's significant interest in trying to collect data but in order to do machine learning, you have to collect lots and lots of data. You have to know lots and lots of results concerning whether it's serious or not. And at the moment, there's not there are not data sets that are available or that we have available, which can be used from the clinical data in order to do the machine learning that would be necessary. So there's an interesting issue of applying machine learning necessity to get better sources of data. And as soon as you talk about human data, you have all kinds of issues, at least in North America, concerning confidentiality and so forth. This is the matter of the created data sets. You are muted, Doctor. Okay. Um, uh, professor, are you able to read chat box? Can I read the chat box? Yeah, because Professor Somal asked her. I tried switching on my microphone. Oh, uh, okay, madam. Okay. No. Yes. Can you you can raise your question, madam? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hi, Liam. Thank you so much for the talk. And uh, yeah, I couldn't switch on my microphone. That's why I put it up in the chat box. But now I think I managed it. So it's exactly what you said just now. Um, for, as answer to the earlier question, uh, since I work with disease data, I find it so difficult to get long time series. So they're essentially monthly data or at the most 10 years, yearly data. So um, is a mathematical methodology um, well developed to handle such short term data to be able to do any prediction? Because all these AIMLs require a large amount of data. So what is your count on that? Yeah. So, so uh, some of the, to, to, train, to train machine learning algorithms, you need large amounts of data. The actual prediction, once you have something trained, you don't need very large amounts of data. You can use short amounts of data. You know, we have several hundred beats, which, you know, which would be 20 minutes or something like that. Uh, so it's conceivable that a predictor would work. Let me just make an, another comment concerning the data, which I think is gonna happen in the future. People now have mobile devices uh, they have Apple watches, they have bands. If they go running, they can be measuring their heartbeat. So someone who is very creative and uh, very entrepreneurial should probably figure out a way, make a website so that everybody can just upload their own data. If you say, I don't care if anybody wants to use my data, here it is. Uh, people people could contribute their own data and they could say, here's what I, here's my heartbeat, here's what I'm doing, here's what I ate, here's the drug that I took. Anybody would be able to upload their own data and then it could potentially be mined. The, there are big issues concerning the quality of the data and so on and so forth, but there, the prescript, the huge difficulties in terms of putting data up by people, you know, in public space, by people who are not studying it, 
uh, but not by people themselves. So that's something to think about in the future. If anybody's entrepreneurial and good with websites, you can make a website where people can uh, people can put up their own data. And if you have millions of people doing that, and if you have some of them falling over and dying while their data is being collected, then you might be able to get data sets big enough so that you can actually do the sorts of machine learning that people might want. Thank you. I hope we reach that situation someday in the world. Great. Uh, Dr. Sarvesh, you can raise your question now. Well, Leon, I have a very simple question in terms of the temporality of the data you're talking about. Um, when you look at infectious diseases like uh, HIV or COVID-19, which are both acute or chronic diseases, how do you factor those elements into explaining cardiovascular disease or physiological compounds that develop over a long period of time? So, you know, I don't, I don't know enough about the manifestations of those diseases to really comment on that. Uh, I, I know that there are cardiologists who are referred, you know, patients who have, uh, who are referred to cardiologists because of development of heart disease. I think that there's some association with, with certain types of uh, heart disease and having, having other, you know, having HIV or, or having COVID or, or other factors, but I, I don't know enough to comment on that. Uh, okay. uh, Professor Ambiga, now. Yeah. yeah, very nice talk. I just want to clarify one point. When I am dealing with a large number of data pertaining to one particular disease, and I have to compare to identify a marker, if I want to make a comparison with a normal state, how do we do it? Because the normal state itself is so diverse and varied. Is there a way of doing it? Or we may not have the data from the same person before the disease, during the disease, etc. So is, is there a way of normalizing this normal state? Yeah. So um, you know, you're you're asking a very, very general question. Yes. And and in the context of what I was talking about in terms of the premature ventricular complexes, uh, although I think that you can say it's normal to have occasional premature ventricular complexes, it's not normal to have thousands per day. It, uh, and there are many people who have thousands of these complexes per day. Um, so if you, if you just have a way to record that and measure it, you have a, a way to, uh, to say something is not normal there. In some cases, there may be baseline recordings, but typically people, if you go to a doctor's office after a certain age, you know, they, they will recommend that you have an electrocardiogram, but this is typically for 10 seconds. And, uh, one of these complexes may or may not show up in, you know, in a short appointment such as that. So I think you have to think very specifically about what particular disease you're talking about and whether a baseline may be established due to normal med medical care or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mayan. Now you can raise your question. Uh, I have few questions related to early warning signal. Actually, I am working in uh, two things. One is uh, aging. Aging is related to early warning signal, signal, and another is related to like population biology. Is related to low population. Low population cell number means uh, like 20 cell or 10 cell, right? Those those cell, low population showing allele effect, right? So 
Yeah. I'm having a little trouble understanding what you're saying. I'm sorry. So I'm asking about the early warning signal, P of the quotients. So what is the relation of the early warning signal with, with the positive feedback loop? So if we will tune, if we will increase the strength of the positive feedback loop, then early warning signal, what will happen, what, what will affect in related to early warning signal? Like uh, when we will increase the strength of the uh, autoregulatory positive feedback loop, the hysteresis will, will increase. So, so, so in case of critical transition, generally critical transition occurs in the equilibrium point, stable equilibrium point or in the steady state point, right? But in case of early earning signal, that is happen before steady state. So when we will increase the strength of the positive feedback loop, so uh, that will increase the, the, the distance from the, from the steady state point to the early earning signal point, right? Because early, early earning signal uh, effect occurs before the steady state, like before steady state. So what will be the relation between the positive feedback loop and, and the early earning signal? If we will tune the strength of the positive feedback uh, loop, then then critical transition occur means what, what, will, what will be the relation, that critical transition? Like generally, generally I am, I am, I am applying only in case of gene and cell, like gene gene correlation divided by cell cell correlation. This is called critical index, right? So what will happen when transition occur, like this critical transition, when, uh, when age is increasing, like those gene gene correlation will increase. So, so what will happen? So critical, critical index will uh, increase when age will increase, right? You, I, I have to excuse myself, but because of the, the sound quality, it was hard for me to follow the question well enough to be able to comment on it. Uh, sorry, I, I'm asking you the, the short question. Like, what is the relation between the autoregulatory feedback loop with the early warning signal? I mean, strength of the strength of the autoregulatory feedback loop. What? So what's the what's the connection between did you say the strength of the order auto regulatory group and the yes 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 yeah 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 because because generally so what I know uh, yes 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 yeah so you know so first of all I I don't understand the question. Uh, I may not understand it well enough to make a, a clear response, but I, I think that a lot of the work on early warning signals now is still at is still in the research stage. So, for example, if you're thinking about here's a, some feedback system, and that feedback system may have an instability that would be associated with disease, then you know the way you would investigate this is by making a mathematical model that had stochastic features on it and then try to uh, examine what, whether you could make early have early warning signals based on the fluctuations in that particular feedback system. So just you know talk talk. Talking in a speculative fashion, a lot of feedback systems can go through the hop bifurcation and stability. And one of the early warning signals bifurcations that Thomas Burry in, in his recent uh, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences paper identified was uh, had criteria for hop bifurcation. So if one had a mathematical model with a negative feedback system, and one was interested in the stability of this to, to an oscillatory instability, presumably tools have been developed in that work, which should be capable of predicting an incipient or a soon forthcoming bifurcation. Yeah, 
Well, that, that's probably about as good as I can get in answering the question. I'm not sure if I've succeeded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is there any relation? Uh, is there any relation between early holding signal? Is there any... And, and any relation of the hysteresis? ST hysteresis. So, so uh, in, in this cusp catastrophe, there's definitely hysteresis that can take place. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, I think that you have to dig into the literature a little bit and possibly even communicate with some of the people who have written articles. I know Thomas Bury would be happy to correspond with people who, who have specific questions and interest in specific applications. You know, the, the work that's been done now, he's developed uh, toolkits for early warning signals, which should be able to be used by people who have some expertise and knowledge in Python. I, I believe that's the language the code is written in. So some of, some of the software that he has done uh, can, it is freely open to other people. And I know in the paper that he's preparing for publication now, I think he's prepared a whole bunch of, of uh, programs which can actually be run by people testing to reproduce the actual computations in the paper. So, uh, you know, stay tuned or people can write to me and I could put them in touch with Thomas Beery or people could look him up in the ENAS article and correspond with him if they're interested in actually implementing something. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you for your answer. So uh, for the single cell uh, uh, RNA sequencing data, so there is one uh, uh, open software, this is called BioTip. Some Stanford group already uh, uh, produced that kind of uh, software. So from the application of bio, uh, BioTip, one can easily determine those early warning signal for the biological data. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that software, but I will mention okay, that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank Thomas. You, thank you for that. So it's BioDeep, and it's at Stanford. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Th thank you, Lynn. Thank you for your uh, answer. Oh, so, are there more questions? Need some clarifications. Oh, of course, we are not uh, receiving more questions. Uh, so, since there are no more questions, I would like to conclude the session by thanking Professor Glass for accepting our invitation and giving a very wonderful talk this morning. Thank you, Professor. This is already late for you to go to the bed. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Okay, so it was my it was my honor to be invited and to have this opportunity. Uh, uh, professor, uh, we are planning to organize a meeting um, at the end of this year. So if possible, please visit us. Thank you so much and much appreciated. Yeah, I will, I, I will write to you the other information by email. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. And, and, we'll, and we'll sign off if we can figure out how to do that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ross.